Right, well, I think it's time to get started. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the mini symposium on the monkey pox outbreak response that's sponsored by the Bacterial and Viral Bioinformatics Resource Center. I'm Richard Shoreman. I'm the director of informatics at the J. Craig Venter Institute, and I'm also the co-PI on the BVBRC project. Um, we have a really exciting program lined up that includes presentations from many of the preeminent investigators in both the research and public health communities that are leading the response to the current monkeypox outbreak. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to take this opportunity to first thank all of our speakers for taking the time out of their busy schedules to participate in the symposium. I also want to thank the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, who is the sponsor of the Bioinformatics Resource Center program. And then most importantly, I want to thank Anna Nivadomska for organizing such a, a really tremendous symposium that we have in store for us today. Um, <clears throat> so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Anna, who will be moderating the session today, and we'll go ahead and get started. Sure, thank you for the welcome and the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to see so many people here and I, I also want to thank our funders and presenters for being so um, um, willing to just share their knowledge and information with everyone. Um, we have a really exciting schedule. We're going to start with Paula Trachtman, who's going to give us a primer before moving on to um, some early morning talks on the current situation of outbreaks in multiple different countries, followed by Emma Hodcroft and Cornelius Romer from Next Train. We'll talk about monkeypox sublineages. Marlene Wolf from Emory, who will be hey, discussing. Anna, we're not see seeing the agenda if you're display wanting to display that. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry about that. I thought I was sharing. Um, I'm actually going to put that in the put the schedule that we currently have in the chat so that everyone can see that. Um, and so everyone should be able to open this Google Docs link. But um, I'm not going to take too much more time. Um, I just want to mention that everything will be recorded and you can find them on our YouTube channel. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Paula Trachtman who is um, the Dean at uh, Medical University of South Carolina and who will be giving us a primer on monkeypox virus. Okay, I am unmuted. And before I put up the slides, thank you for the invitation. I must say I'm- Absolutely unmuted. I'm, uh, uh, excuse me? I thought I heard somebody speaking. Thank you for the invitation. And I personally am very excited to see this symposium and to see the scientific community responding to to something that you know some of us have been anticipating perhaps for any number of years and for which i think that we are there's a lot of scientific knowledge that we could be poised to utilize so i'm happy to be here and very daunting task to to do this introduction and apologize in advance for things i left out but we'll be very happy to to answer questions um Okay, I'm going to try to put up my slides. So much Paula for doing this. Please and tell me if you can see those. Does that work? Um, not no, yet. Not yet. Not yet. Hmm. Worked just, when we tested it. All right. Of course, just testing through. PowerPoint. Share. Oh, e that works, I think. Yep. There it is. Is that working? Yeah, very nice. Yes. Okay. Definitely. Very good. Thank you. And just to okay, so let you know, I will just give you a, a nudge at the 12 minute mark. Okay. Nudge me. <laughs> Virtual nudge. Um, so what I'm going to do today is try to give you a, a kind of a primer on monkeypox by using vaccinivirus as the model, which we've studied for many decades. And as far as we know, there really are few, if any, differences in the overall choreography. So this is a picture of the life cycle, and, and this slide will come back several times over the next 12 minutes. So just briefly going to make a point that the large virion, which is about 
75 by 250 nanometers has at least 75 different proteins. It's a very complicated particle, membrane bound with the genome, large number of enzymes and structural particles. And these virions are extraordinarily stable, extraordinarily stable. They will hang around without losing infectivity in many cases. And that's part of the life cycle evolution of these viruses to be able to persist on surfaces, blankets, bed sheets, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna walk through this life cycle to give you a sense of, I think some of the important things to understand and also some of the targets for therapeutics should we choose to go in that direction. So first of all, these orthopox viruses, vaccinia, monkeypox, variola, have double-strand DNA genomes of about 200 kilobases. They encode about 200 genes and 200 proteins. So that is a huge genome and proteome in the, in the world of viruses. The genes, as you know, have no introns. They have very short five prime and three prime UTRs. So they are really crammed in the life cycle. And as you walk your way throughout the genome, different genes are transcribed from different gene, uh, strands of the DNA. So both strands are used for coding in different regions. Most strikingly, I think, the life cycle of these pox viruses is restricted to the cytoplasm. And that is unique among DNA viruses that infect um, animal cells. So this gives both physical and genetic autonomy from the host nucleus, which is really quite striking. In the laboratory, the infectious cycle and the strains and the cells we use is about 16 hours. That's the sort of time frame we use. There's a cascade of three phases of gene expression uh, interspersed within which is DNA replication and virion assembly. Compartmentalization within the cytoplasm in membrane-bound organelles or just cytoplasmic neighborhoods is an emerging theme. And there are two types of virions that are produced. The um, mature virions, which are intracellular until the cell bursts, probably 95% of the virions that are made, and they stay within the cell and are responsible for host-to-host -host spread. They're carried in the pox, in the lesions, both in the enanthem on mucosal surfaces and the exanthem on the skin. And they are what spreads from host to host. The minority, maybe 5% are extracellular virions. They're released from the cell via exocytosis. They're more fragile and they are responsible for cell to cell spread within an infected organism. So the different virions have different roles. So back to our life cycle, we have entry of the virion into the host cell and depending on the cell type and on the viral strain, that can occur either by direct fusion at the cell surface or by uh, macro pinocytosis, sorry, that's a typo, and endosomal release within the cell. Uh, so, and this is a complicated process that's still not very well understood. There's a, a entry fusion complex of at least 10 proteins that mediates entry. Uh, what we do know is that nobody has found a cell type that cannot be bound or infected by the virus. So entry seems to be pretty ubiquitous. Once entered, the membrane is shed. There's a core within the virion that undergoes a kind of plumping up and activation and is the site for early gene expression using enzymes that have been brought in in the particle. The next stage after early genes are expressed, and that's about 75 genes or perhaps close to 100, the uh, core undergoes kind of an uncoding, releases the genome into the cytoplasm, where it's assembled into a pre-replication focus, and then DNA replication occurs within a membrane-bound compartment that's usually called a, a factory. And this process leads to enormous amplification of the genome. It's estimated that at peak times of infection, the amount of viral DNA is uh, a third the amount of nuclear DNA. So this is really, really robust replication. And it involves a large group of proteins because this protein 
uh, this virus replicates in the cytoplasm, it brings in most of its core machinery, the uh, holoenzyme, single-strand binding protein, ligase, a fen one like endonuclease, a scaffold pro protein. So this is really ripe for targeting for therapeutics. And the only therapeutic that has been developed against a polymerase is zidofafir, which, um, you know, is efficacious but has limitations as, as a drug. But I think that there's um, lots of room within this sphere to think about what makes these viruses unique. And the proteins are massively uh, similar among the different orthopox viruses. Back to our life cycle then, after the replication uh, commences and continues from probably three hours post-infection to 10 hours post-infection, shortly after it begins, the cascade of gene expression switches to intermediate gene expression and then late gene expression, making new proteins that are largely going to be involved in the process of morphogenesis, which is the assembly of new virions. And this process is also very unique. These are the only um, known envelope virions that do not acquire their envelope by butting into or out of a cellular membrane compartment. Instead, they develop the membrane inside the cytoplasm in a process that we believe, and I apologize for these gene names, just forget those, but we believe it begins by the diversion of membranes from the ER to make what are called crescents. And these crescents snuggle up to depots of proteins that are going to be encapsulated into the virion. The shape and rigidity of these membranes is provided by a viral scaffold protein known as D13, uh, which is a, has the double jelly roll motif and is like the capsid proteins of many other viruses. But in this case, it's an exoskeleton and it is shed before virion maturation. But that exoskeleton gives shape and uh, size and structure to these developing crescents and immature virions, which acquire these proteins, acquire a genome. And then some proteolytic events occur that crack the exoskeleton off, the internal structure changes, and we end up with these very classical brick-shaped virions with a dumbbell-shaped core. This is just an example of an electron micrograph. Uh, these are the crescents, immature virions, immature virions with a nucleoid, and mature virions. So it is a very aesthetically pleasing process to study. Back to our diagram then, this makes these virions, mature virions, as I said, about 95% of the virions made are these virions, but a small subset goes either to the Golgi late endosomes or perhaps multivesicular bodies that's still up for debate, where they acquire a additional two membranes from these organelles. These are then called wrapped virions. They transit on microtubules to the cell surface where they undergo exocytosis, losing the outermost membrane, and so they leave with two membranes. The MV membrane and a new EV. And that step of wrapping and egress is what's targeted by Ticorovirumat or TPOX or ST246 as it was first developed by SEGA. So that is kind of the overview of the life cycle. And you can see it really is a life cycle progressing through these stages gene expression, replication, morphogenesis, and in a subset of cases, wrapping and egress. So I do want to mention that although there's a tremendous amount of autonomy, there's more and more sense that the virus uh, really exploits and, and manipulates um, the cytoskeleton, the membrane systems uh, of, of the cell. And so there is an intimate relationship despite the genetic autonomy. So I wanted then to raise um, some, I think, points for discussion or for consideration. First of all, what about cell and tissue tropism, which is what's on everybody's mind? I think that's pretty clear. It does not occur at the level of virion binding or um, entry. 
Uh, we do know that infection of quiescent cells within the body is dependent on numerous viral proteins that had been considered non-essential when people studied the virus in proliferating cells in, in cell culture. So I think we still have something to learn about that. It remains unknown whether there are host factors that participate in transcription or replication. There's evidence that there are some. There's a whole massive literature of dramatic influence um, of the of the the virus on the innate immune signaling. I can't remember. Uh, we're up to about more than a dozen proteins in vaccinia virus that affect NF kappa B signaling. There are many proteins that affect interferon. Um, and there's a dramatic influence as well on cell death pathways as the cell tries to fight back um, by undergoing apoptosis, for example, in order to prevent uh, infectious from proceeding. In terms of virulence in an intact animal, we know or person, there's complex interplay between the virus and the innate immune system. It's certainly been said that in smallpox, it was a cytokine storm from the massive response to this uh, beast of a virus and all the viral proteins that really led to uh, the overwhelming um, uh, uh, systemic effects rather than a kind of a lytic effect on any particular organ. So monkeypox virus, what do we know? Very, very closely related to variola and vaccinia virus. Now, vaccinia virus has an extremely broad host range. It will infect almost every cell type and almost every species. In contrast, variola virus has a very narrow host range. We think of it as human specific and really limited to humans, although there is an infectious model in cynomologous monkeys. So the nine, but that was very difficult to establish, requires very high titers of virus and is really pushing beyond what could happen, I think, in the wild. So for monkeypox, it was first identified in a research colony of monkeys. Thereafter, it was found in certain regions of Africa and certainly was thought to be and reported as being endemic in those areas in rodents with sporadic spread to humans and very poor person-to-person -person spread. That's how certainly I learned about it. That is in all the literature that you read. Um, you know, I think that the thought was that um, <clears throat> certainly prior vaccination with vaccinia is protective, and undoubtedly that contained infection um, in, in people in um, in people in the African countries and communities where this was endemic in rodents. There's still debate about what type of rodents. Um, are infected and how extensive that um, endemic nature is. In 2003, many of you will know that there was an importation into the U.S. and exotic pets, uh, door mice and giant Gambian pouch rats, and that spread to prairie dogs through a swap meet and infected a significant number, 40 or so people in the human Midwest. Um, that led to some hospitalizations, but no deaths, and it was a reasonably mild infection um, and no evidence of human-to-human -human spread. So the people that were infected did not spread the virus to family members. Because we know, um, especially after that work, that there were um, uh, genomic analyses and definition of uh, of two clades of virus, the West African versus the Congo, with a tenfold difference of mortality in Africa. And, you know, I think we still am not clear on why that is. The, the publications that were reported could predict um, clade membership, could predict mortality, but probably it's a relatively subtle constellation of impacts on cytokines such as IL-1 beta and, and, and the larger immune system, which may be more difficult to study in tissue culture. Paula, sorry that to is, interrupt, I think, but we're- Excuse uh, me? I said, sorry to interrupt, Paula, but we're almost at time. Okay, this is my last slide. So um, the, the last question I think on everybody's mind is, has the virus changed? And did it evolve? Is it now better at person-to-person -person spread? when we always thought it wasn't. And um, I'm not sure there's any data that supports that. 
I think it is more likely that what we're seeing is social and community events that accelerate spread. So uh, racing through an awful lot, I hope that in some way that's helpful. Um, how shall we proceed?